Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Audrey Gamble. I am soil scientist for the Alabama Cooperative Extension System, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Crop Soil and Environmental Sciences at Auburn. And so today I'm going to be giving a webinar on cover crop systems for specialty crops. Um, I primarily work in the area of row crops or agronomic crops, um, but I think a lot of the information related to um, cover crops for row crop systems relates very well. Um, so um, hopefully this will be beneficial to you all. So to get started, I want to talk about why we plant cover crops. So cover crops are crops which are grown when our cash crops are not actively growing. And we typically are planting them to provide some benefits to the soil. And there's an array of benefits that cover crops can provide and it's um, up to the producer to determine you know, which of these benefits are most important to them. So at minimum, cover crops typically help to protect against soil erosion and runoff of nutrients. Um, they also can help to conserve soil moisture, improve organic matter storage, which um, is very important for improving nutrient holding and water holding capacity and overall health of a soil. Um, they can also be used to suppress early season weeds. They can help improve water infiltration, provide supplemental nitrogen in the case of legumes. Um, they can scavenge for nutrients and break up soil compaction. So today I'm gonna to be going over just some basics of implementing cover crop systems. And as I go along, I'm also gonna to try to point you in the direction of additional resources that you can use to get more in-depth information. Um, so this is kind of my outline for the presentation. First, I'm gonna start with how we select cover crops um, to, to fit in with our cash crop rotation. Then I'm also gonna go through some basics of cover crop planning and cover crop management, as well as cover crop termination. And lastly, planning into cover crop residues. So to get us started about thinking how we're gonna select our cover crop species, I first wanna talk about uh, the amount of uh, residue that a cover crop can provide, because the amount of residue or biomass that a cover crop provides is very important for um, achieving certain goals. So as I mentioned before, um, even at low levels of biomass as seen in these first two pictures here, we can at least help protect against erosion and nutrient loss to an extent. We can also help with water infiltration. Um, but some of these other benefits that we achieve through cover crops, such as increased organic matter storage and suppression of weeds, actually take very high levels of biomass. And so um, it's important for producers to think about what benefits they're trying to achieve as they select their cover crops and decide how they're going to manage their cover crops. So these are some of the considerations that I think are very important for cover crop selection. Um, and, and typically the first questions I would ask a producer um, if they may be asking for advice on which cover crops to implement. So the first question is somewhat obvious, but what cover crop planning dates work with your crop rotation. Um, obviously, you're, if you're using, um, if you're planting summer cash crops, you're gonna um, implement a, a winter cover. Um, and on, conversely, if you're planting um, a winter cash crop, you're gonna be looking at summer covers to implement. And so, um, but we can get a little bit more specific with that too, and I'll talk about that in coming slides. Um, one of the most important considerations is what benefits are, am I trying to achieve? Um, I have a picture above this here of a brassica. Brassicas have a, a deep tap root, which can go and scavenge for nutrients deeper in the soil profile and bring them up. Um, they also, certain brassicas have the ability to suppress certain nematodes and so, uh, and plant parasitic nematodes specifically. So these are some of the considerations that you may have is what, what are you trying to achieve with a cover crop? Um, and then lastly, what cash crop will follow my cover crop? And so um, this is important because certain covers can actually negatively impact the, the growth of a cash crop and that's not what we want. So for example, if we're growing a legume cash crop, we don't want to plant a legume cover crop before that cash crop because um, planting a legume in rotation with a legume can promote um, disease cycles and it can also um, inhibit those uh, rhizobacteria that help legumes fix their own nitrogen. And so that's um, a, a specific consideration. And then in certain cases, 
there can actually be allelopathic effects of a cover crop residue on a fallen cash crop. And that just means that, that the plant itself may cause harm to the fallen cash crop. So an example of that would be um, planting corn following ryegrass. Ryegrass, as opposed to cereal rye, um, has an allelopathic effect on corn. And so um, those are some considerations as well. So um, kind of going back to that first question of what cover crops work with your crop rotation. Um, these are some typical planting dates that we would use for fall and winter cover crops. And this is um, taken from the Southern Cover Crop Council, um, of which I'm a board member, and I'll, I'll point this out in future slides, but this is a great place to go for additional information on cover crops. But we put together these um, planting guides for uh, dates at which specific cover crops should be planted. Um, you'll notice that you know a lot of our winter covers such as oats and rye, um, they do best when planted particularly in October and then you know can can be beneficial as well um, in November. But as we start to move down to our brassicas like daikon radish, these really have to be planted um, a good bit earlier in order to really produce. Um, so brassicas like daikon radish like to be planted as early as August and on through September. Um, and once we get in, into November in Alabama, this is typically too late to plant uh, brassica. Um, this is the same type of graph, but showing early spring and summer planted cover crops. Um, so again, most of these covers, um, you can plant them in May and June. This includes our, our summer grasses like millet, and sorghum sudan grass, legumes like cow peas and sun hemp, and um, some of our broadleaves. But these um, spe same species can, some of them can be planted um, through August, whereas um, others, such as cow peas, we, um, sorry, such as um, buckwheat, we may not want to plant that plant that late. So the next consideration when it comes to cover crop selection um, that I mentioned was what benefits are you trying to achieve? And um, we can kind of group cover crops into these three categories when we're thinking about benefits. Um, the first category and our most prominent category as far as cover crops planted in Alabama would be small grains, um, such as rye and oats when we're thinking about winter cover crops or millet and sorghum Sudan when we're thinking about summer cover crops. These are excellent at producing a very high biomass, especially when they're planted in a timely manner. Um, this high biomass can serve to um, help with weed suppression in the early season, conserve soil moisture, and improve soil organic matter. Um, they also, of course, can help with nutrient scavenging with their um, root systems, as well as help prevent erosion. Legumes such as um, clovers, um, vetches, sun hemp, these are, are excellent for fixing nitrogen for the subsequent cash crop. Um, and brassicas or other broadleaves, um, some examples being uh, of brassicas being radish and canola, these have deep tap roots. And um, in some cases, uh, they can help to break up soil compaction and they can also scavenge for nutrients deeper in the soil profile. And this is just to go a little bit more in depth with uh, the legumes. This gives an example of nitrogen production per acre. So um, a lot of our clovers, vetches, they'll produce approximately 150, 100 to 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre, um, depending on the stand that you have. Um, of course, not all of that nitrogen is going to be available to the subsequent crop, but we can typically get about a 30 to 50 pound um, nitrogen credit on the subsequent crop per acre um, when we follow a legume. A very obvious consideration when selecting cover crops would be where you can get seed. Um, so we we have on the southerncovercrops.org website, um, we have some um, seed sources listed by state. You can see we have a few listed in Alabama. If you have any that you would like to add to this list, please feel free to contact me. I'll provide my contact information at the end of this presentation. Um, but you can go to this website to access um, websites and phone numbers for, for some of our um, local seed sources. So moving on from cover crop selection to cover crop planting. 
Um, cover crop can be planted in a variety of ways, but the most uniform stand is going to be provided um, with a drill because that um, ensures good seed to, seed to soil contact. Um, and we can also broadcast seed on top of the soil surface, surface um, but we're typically going to have to increase seeding rates by approximately 20 to 50 percent um, when we broadcast. So on the southerncovercrop.org website, we do have information sheets for each, for a variety of cover crop species, which tells seeding rates for um, drilled planting, as well as recommended seeding rates for broadcasting, as well as seeding depth um, and some additional information on those specific cover crops. And we also have uh, resource guides for setting up and calibrating drills and spreaders. Um, and this is the, the link to find those. This is just an example of the types of information sheets that we have. Um, so in this particular case, I selected uh, the, the information sheet for cereal rye. So you can see we have some um, information about specific varieties. We have planting information, including depth, seeding rates, and then we also have some information on how to terminate that cover crop and um, just some, some of the specific traits of that crop and um, such as um, the relative cost, the typical amount of bi biomass that it produces, um, and, so, and some specific um, cautions that you may, may need to follow. Um, so these are an excellent resource for um, finding out information about a specific cover crop as, and also whether this specific cover crop will um, provide the benefits that you're trying to achieve on your farm. Um, moving on to cover crop management, I want to briefly cover um, fertilization of cover crops. Um, for pH, phosphorus, and potassium, we're going to want to um, maintain um, soil test recommendations. Um, so of course you can always take a soil sample and send it to the Auburn University Soil Testing Lab um, to determine that. Typically, um, as long as we're maintaining our pH, phosphorus, and potassium for our cash crops, um, they should be an adequate supply for our cover crops. Um, however, when it comes to nitrogen, we're going to have some different considerations. So nitrogen management is going to depend on the type of species as well as the amount of biomass that you're trying to achieve, specifically with small grains, which we're often planning for um, that high biomass, we may have to supplement some nitrogen. Um, so supplemental nitrogen of, of 30, 50 pounds will be necessary typically to get that um, additional biomass. And if we delay planting past the optimum window, we may even have to apply more nitrogen to meet our biomass goals. And so this graph that I'm showing here, um, this is some research that was done at the um, Soil Dynamics Lab, USDA Soil Dynamics Lab in Auburn, Alabama. Um, it just shows rye biomass according to nitrogen rate. And this is, was um, done at one of our research stations in Alabama. And it's showing um, here in the red line, we can see early to mid-December planting dates. Um, for rye, and then we have in green mid to late November. In yellow, we have early to mid November, and in blue, we have mid to late October. So you can see the earlier we planted our rye, the more biomass we achieved, but we were able to make up for it a bit when we put out nitrogen. But this highlights the importance of getting your cover crop planted in a timely manner so you don't have to add more cost to your system by applying more fertilizer. So here, when we compare uh, an early to mid-December planting date to the mid to late October planting date, you can see it took us 90 pounds of nitrogen to achieve approximately the same amount of biomass that we achieved with no nitrogen at our earliest planting date. So again, you can, can work around your nitrogen, um, nitrogen rates according to how much biomass you're trying to achieve and when you planted. Um, and that applies to um, our small grain covers. When we have a legume in the mixture, um, we typically do not need to apply that additional nitrogen as long as we have approximately 30% um, 30 per, 30 stand cover of our um, legume cover crop. So it is important though to make sure you inoculate legume seed. Um, this helps promote nitrogen fixation 
Um, and you can um, look up, for instance, on those fact sheets, what specific inoculant is needed for a specific legume. Moving on to cover crop termination. Um, so termination is just when we um, kill the cover crop in, in preparation for planting of the following cash crop. And timing of termination is, um, it's critical for optimizing bi biomass production. We want to allow enough time for our cover crop to grow to, to really produce a good bit of biomass typically. Um, but we often want to terminate two to four weeks prior to planting to help ensure that we have good soil moisture. Um, since actively growing cover crops can deplete soil moisture. And this also helps to prevent nitrogen immobilization, which is important with small grain. So when we have a, a lot of small grain residue on the soil surface, it has a high carbon to nitrogen ratio and it actually can tie up um, the amount of nitrogen, uh, or it can tie up nitrogen um, as we apply nitrogen for our cash crop. Um, and terminating ahead of time can reduce the risk of some insect pests as well as um, seedling board diseases. There are producers who are able to um, plant into standing cover crops or um, plant, uh, terminate directly at planting or right after planting. However, we recommend um, that if you're attempting to do this, you start out on a very small area because it is a little bit more risky um, to terminate that late in the season, just because of these, these reasons that I have listed on this slide. Um, but but there, there can be some benefits to that, but, but we suggest that if you're interested in terminating, you know, right at planting or planting into an actively growing cover, that you do that on a very small area or acreage to, to try that out and make sure you can learn to manage it appropriately. Um, there's several different methods for termination. Um, and I'm gonna go through three of those right now. Um, chemically terminating means that we're spraying with herbicides. Um, and I, ha I don't have time to go through um, specific herbicides to use or, or tank mixes to use for specific um, cover crops, but we do have information about that on the southerncovercrops.org website. I've got the link to that here. Um, so you can check that out. The, the advantages of chemical termination are that we can, um, leave the residue on the soil surface. And, and this is very important when we're trying to achieve weed suppression and um, improve soil moisture storage in our fields. Um, some additional options for terminating cover crops is roller crimping. Um, and you can, you can also crimp without, um, oh, that, that shouldn't actually not say with or without rolling, but um, cover rolling and crimping is another um, method to terminate small grain cover crops specifically. Um, when it, it's not as easy to kill um, legume covers or our broadleaf covers through rolling and crimping. Um, and it, it often takes three to four passes with a roller crimper to kill those, those covers. But small grains, as you can see in this top picture here, this is a picture of a roller crimper. It's just basically a bar that has um, these, um, kind of blade soldered onto them that will cut into, not actually cut through the cover, but will crimp that cover and um, kind of kill the vascular tissue or uh, cut into the vascular tissue and prevent that crop from um, continuing to grow. Um, but again, this is, is not as effective for a legume cover crop. So um, when crimping a small grain, we typically crimp at soft dough stage or later and soft dough is kind of um, intuitive, it's when that grain that's being produced, um, when you push into it with your fingers, that it, it kind of feels like a soft dough. And the ground should not be soft at the time of rolling and crimping because um, in order to, to crimp into that residue, um, we need to have a, a little bit hard ground um, in order to effectively crimp. Um, mowing and incorporating is another option for cover crop termination, and this is um, more frequently used in organic systems. Um, this, um, when, you're, when you're mowing and incorporating, there's some considerations. So cover crops are easier to kill with mowing when they've reached maturity, um, whether that be, um, you know, grain fill with a, um, with a small grain cover crop or full bloom with a legume cover. Um, 
it's, it's easier to kill them when they're at maturity. Um, and mowed cover crop residue should be incorporated with tillage as soon as possible. Um, but you want to keep in mind that you, you don't want to have more residue than your tillage equipment can handle turning under the soil. Um, so that's a specific consideration for mowing and incorporating. Um, so mowing and incorporating, it has, has the advantage of that you don't have to use um, chemicals to terminate, but then you don't have that residue on the soil surface to um, help with, with moisture storage and, and weed suppression. Um, so moving from termination to planting into your cover crop residue. Um, these are just some considerations for um, setting up your planters. Um, of course, when you have a, a residue that hasn't been turned under um, and you just have it laying on the soil surface, in order to plant through that, you're gonna need a sharp coulter to ensure that residue is cut and doesn't wrap with whatever type of planter you're using. Um, so I've got a picture here. Um, this all, this is a, on the bottom here, we've got a, a no-till vegetable transplanter um, and it has coulters that are cutting through the residue that's shown in this photo um, in order to, to create an area that we can get good seed to soil, or uh, transplant contact with the soil. Um, also important, um, coulters, going back to coulters, these perform best on firm ground. So um, anytime you're, you're using coulter to cut through residue, um, you want to avoid, try to avoid that wrapping, so put it far enough in, in front of any tillage equipment, um, conservation tillage equipment to avoid that. Um, wheel cleaners are also important to help ensure seed to soil contact. These basically just sweep residue out of the way as you're planting. You can see a picture of that on the, this top picture here. Um, this is a, a row cleaner um, that just kind of sweeps that residue out of the way um, while planting. And it's also important to maintain correct down pressure and, and use closing wheels so that you can, if you're planting seed, that you can um, ensure uh, seeds to soil contact as those wheels press back down. And you can't see it in this picture here, but there's actually some closing wheels on this vegetable transplanter that um, help to um, kind of put pressure on the soil around, around the transplant. Um, so that's a, a brief introduction to cover crops. For more information, um, I've mentioned several times the website southerncovercrops.org. Again, this is a group of um, scientists, uh, university scientists, government scientists, farmers um, from throughout the south, southern region of the United States who have put together information. We have, this is some examples of fact sheets such as um, how to terminate with herbicides, how to ensure good seed to soil contact. Um, should you fertilize your cover crop? We've got a little schematic for that. So um, I encourage you to check this website out. Another website will, is um, alabamasoilhealth.org. This is on the Alabama Cooperative Extension System website and it was sponsored by the Alabama Soil and Water Conservation Committee. So we've actually tried to put together some information um, just on soil health and how cover crops can improve soil health. On this website, we've also tried to put all of our research related to cover crops um, both from Auburn University and Extension, as well as the uh, USDA Soil Dynamics Lab. And we've tried to, to update research on here. And um, we have it divided into row crops, specialty crops, and pasture and hay, soil conservation. And so there's some, some information on cover crops on here as well. Um, so that's all I have today. Thank you. If anyone has any questions, please send them to agamble at auburn.edu. Um, I've also listed my phone number here. Um, so um, again, thank you for, for your attention and I hope you all have a good day.